so um, the story goes back. Um, so here's a little outline of what we'll do. Uh, this, first of all, this is a joint work with uh, Jesse Cass, Jake Solomon, and Kirsten Wickelgren. Wickelgren, Belshin J. It's really difficult. And um, so first, I'll talk about some of the background over the complex numbers. That's the classical case, and then uh, Belshin J's uh, innovation, looking at the real case. And then I'll start, uh, so the motivic part is to trying to get a, a quadratic version of these invariants of counting curves, counting rational curves in a linear system. So that um, involves taking the Konchevich um, moduli space of stable maps and symmetrizing it um, to take care of uh, arithmetic uh, information. And then we'll discuss uh, the important thing is the evaluation map. We'll discuss the geometry of the evaluation map and how that gives us a, um, a description of the ramification of the evaluation map. And then we'll use the uh, universal curve and the universal map to construct a relative orientation for this evaluation map. And at the end, we'll prove this uh, invariance theorem, which is a generalization of uh, to a refinement, the quadratic case of Velshinje's invariant theorem. Okay, so um, in the classical case, uh, it started with uh, the problem of counting uh, rational curves of degree D in P2 in the following sense. So we fix some uh, degree D, let's say bigger than or equal to three to make it a little more interesting. And then we have the linear system of curves of degree D. So L is the, just the line and the linear system are the, all the curves in P2 that are linearly equivalent to D times a line. In other words, just curves in P2, such that C is a degree D curve. Okay, and um, by looking at the defining equations of these curves, well, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the curves and the defining equations modulo scalars. So that makes, and that's true for any linear system, it says that this linear system is a projective space and uh, just count the dimension of curves of degree, of equations of degree D, and you see that it's uh, exactly this projective space. And um, also if you take a general, so for example, a smooth such curve of degree D has a genus G, let's call it G, and it turns out to be, well, the, the junction formula tells you it's D minus one, uh, D minus two over two. So you look at the difference between these two numbers, and that gives you the magic number N, which is 3D minus one. It's the difference in the dimension of the full linear system, the full projective space of curves of degree D, and the genus of a smooth member. Now, if you look at the whole curves moving around, you impose the condition that instead of it being smooth, that it has a single ordinary double point. That gives you a locally closed subset. You take the closure. That's a co-dimension one uh, subset. And if you do that for exactly G of them, you get a co-dimension G subset of rational curves. So now on the other hand, if you fix, uh, every time you fix a point, and require that the curve pass through a point, that's also a co-dimension one subset. So if you require, put those two counts together, require C in DL to contain <clears throat> following subset, you take um, N points, this magic number here, uh, let's say general, then there are finitely many, let's say ND um, curve C in LD containing those points. So let me just put a little subscript X star. Those are the ones that contain all the points which, ha which uh, have normalization. So it'll have singular points. You remove the singularities, which is a rational curve. In other words, which is a P1. And moreover, the curve, each of these, since the points are general, each such C has exactly G ordinary double points as singularities. 
So that's the situation. You look at the number of uh, the difference between the dimension of the whole space and the genus imposing one ordinary double point is one condition, passing through a point is one condition. You put them together and you see that if you impose the right number of uh, conditions of the curves passing through so and so many points, then finitely many of them will uh, have exactly G ordinary double points. I mean, if the points are general. And if you take special points, then everything goes crazy, but that's the general situation. So the basic problem is the question or problem question problem, what is this number? And there is an answer, which was, um, I think originally due to Konsevich. There were a lot of people before that. Konsevich, Manin came up with an answer. And also, um, see that was also um, Luan Tuan using some different methods. Tian Li, Li Tian. They found an answer. And so it's some formula a formula, which um, if pressed, I will give you, but let me just, it's a complicated recursive formula, but um, that's not what we're going to talk about here. We're not going to find any formulas. So let me just mention uh, what did Konsevich Manin do? Um, so there are a number of ways you can approach this problem. Um, one way is just by looking at uh, a degree of a discriminant locus, um, but that's rather difficult. Um, although it does generalize nicely to higher genus. But what Konsevich Manin did, and it's due to ideas of Konsevich, the idea was instead of thinking of it as cutting out um, the rational curves in a linear system, you instead want to look at all maps of rational curves to the plane and then cut out those which pass through your endpoints. It's coming, it's still the same count, but it's counting it in a different way. So, what are about maps? Uh, so what you do, Konsevich says, you look at the moduli space. Let's introduce the notation M zero N P two D of stable maps of degree D P ones are rational curves of degree D N pointed genus, genus zero curves maps to P two. Okay, so let me say a little bit about that. This is of course uh, representing a functor. So what's the, in fact, we can do this more generally, the, the nicest, you can do this for a general surface, but for us, the uh, general situation is for Del, del Pezzo surfaces. So let me say about that, let S be a Del Pezzo surface. So what is that? If you take the canonical class, so that's the line bundle, the divisor associated to the canonical line bundle, in other words, the uh, determinant of the differentials, take its minus, this is ample. So in fact, that's, a, that's an abstract definition, but what it means is that S is either equal to P1 cross P1, or it's P2 blown up at, um, at most, eight points. And the eight points have to be uh, sufficiently general. They can't lie on too many curves of small degree. Okay, so one classic example is the cubic surface in P3. And cubic, well, that's interesting. What's the, where does the three come in in the cubic surface? You have the degree of the del pezzo, which is the self-intersection number of this ample class. So the cubic surface is embedded in P3 by minus its canonical class. And that means when you take minus the canonical class squared, which is of course the same thing as canonical class squared, it gives you the degree of the embedded surface, which is three. So for example, for P2, this number is nine. 
and it goes, since you've blown up at most eight points, it goes all the way down to one. And the idea is these surfaces become more and more complicated as the degree gets smaller. Okay, so that's one number associated with this. And then you also fix a, so it's called a curve class, a curve D, an effective curve. So just some curve on the, it could be a positive sum of, you know, sum with positive integer coefficients of irreducible curves on S. And let's let D equal the degree with respect to the canonical embedding. So it's just this intersection number. And then we have this magic number N will be minus this, this degree, so D minus one. And for example, if S is equal to P2, then minus KS is three times a line, uh, so that DS is nine, as I said. And uh, if we take D to be D times L, then, well, then what's this N? This N is exactly this number, 3D minus one, which came up before. So it turns out this is the magic number. So uh, what that says is in general, if you take N general points, X1 up to XN on S, then the set of C in the linear system of D, in other words, curves which are in the same class, if you, in this case, it's the same homology class or the same linear equivalence class, it doesn't matter, as D, such that C contains all these N points. If you look inside there, and C is rational, though the normalization is rational, is a finite set, And what you want to do is with, you know, so let's say the order of this set, let's call equal to N D S. So this N little D last time was the case where S was the P2. So this was the example, but this was the, here, this is the general case. This is general. All right. So, and that's the problem. So how did, cons what does this have to do with maps? So um, you take, now you let M bar zero N S D. This is equal to the moduli space or stack will we'll be, it'll actually be a scheme when we throw away enough things which we don't care about, so call stack, whatever of stable maps. So what is this? Um, so um, let's see, it's the set of maps F from some P, I'll say what the P is in a second, to S together with endpoints where here P is a sort of semi, it's a semi-stable genus zero curve. So it's a tree of P1s, P1s, where they're joined together. Uh, there's no three of them through a point. So something like this. You could have several connecting one component. So that's a tree of P1s. Um, the xi are in P, but in the smooth locus, they don't, where two curves cross, the xi's are not allowed to be there. And F is a stable map So, well, F together with the xi's are stable. So what does that mean? It means if you consider uh, the F is a map and you look at automorphisms of F that fix the XIs that are only finitely many. That's the stability condition. And let's see, what's the D? If you take the push forward of the fundamental class of this curve, this is in the linear system D. 
So it's homologous to D. Okay, so that's, a, that's what a point of this thing is. And in general, you have to say what families are, but let's not do that. Good, so that's that. And uh, what does that have to do with our question? Well, we have this evaluation map from this. So the main point of it is this is, this is a proper gadget. It's compact. That's one important fact about this. So we have this um, map, the evaluation map going to S to the N, where what does it do if you have your F together with your points on your curve? F is a map from P to S. You send it to the tuple of points, F of X1 up to F of Xn. Oh, I should have said, of course, the Xi's are in the smooth locus and they're distinct. Distinct points. Sorry, forgot. Okay. So I hope that's clear. There, there's a question. From yes. Kirsten. Uh, can question. you see it or I can read it? Uh, when you write a tree of P1s, it looks like you're working over an algebraically closed field. Yes, so I'm talking, these are the geometric points. Exactly right. So, uh, yeah, so this is what a point of this thing looks like over an algebraically closed field. But I'm not assuming the base field is algebraically closed. That's exactly right. Thanks for the question. Hope that clarifies. Okay, so, but I am going to assume for the talk today, assume that the characteristic of K is zero. I'll say a word at the end about what to do in positive characteristic. Okay, so we have this evaluation map. That's just a little side thing. And, and the point is that if you fix, if you say that this is equal to P1 up to Pn, in other words, you fix N general points in S, what's the fiber? Well, the fiber are all the rational curves, which are in the linear system D that pass through those points. So what that says is that the, uh, for a general point, the number of points in the fiber is this NSD. So it says that this NSD is just equal to the degree of this evaluation now. Another way to say it is if you take the evaluation map and you look at it a map, at a map on cycles or on varieties or whatever, if you take this and apply it to the fundamental class, this turns out to also be um, irreducible in most cases. Let's not worry about that. But take the sum of the irreducible components. They're all gonna be of the same dimension. You take the push forward of this thing, it's actually equal to this multiple NSD, so the degree, times the fundamental class of S to the N. Okay, so we can count this guy as a degree of a map or as measuring this integer invariant, which tells us what the push forward of the fundamental class is. All right, so let's uh, look at Velshin J's, how was that? Velshin J's uh, real story. Story over R. All right. So when I say general point, what this means is um, there's some Zariski open subset inside of S to the N where this number is actually equal to the number for any of those points. And uh, if you're working over C, so this is this is this let's say this is working over uh, when you're counting, we should be counting on geometric points. So let's say we're working over C and just taking um, closed points then the uh, subset of S to the N, any is a risky open subset, which is not empty is connected. So it means that this number really doesn't depend on the choice of the points as long as they're general. Okay, so um, what happens in the reals? This is no longer the case. So if you, you have a counting problem, similar counting problem over R. So let's assume that our surface S is defined over R. So it's defined by equation, real equations. So we can think of it as a complex manifold, but also a real manifold by looking at the real points. And let's assume that the chosen general collection of points is real. So in other words, 
that um, we can break it up. So well, let's say P1 up to PR are actually real points of S, and then the remainder are in complex conjugate pairs. So we have PR plus one, PR plus one conjugate up to say PS, PS conjugate and total number N, R plus two S plus N. So that's a real configuration, some real points and then some complex conjugate pairs of points. And then you can ask for real curves containing those points. So the question is how many, so we can take this to be real and general, still general. So it's general in the complex sense. How many of the NDS curves that we talked about, these rational curves contain, containing the PIs are real? And the answer is, it depends. There's not one answer because if you think about this, well, okay, these complex conjugate points, these move around in some open subset of S to the, you know, you can think of just taking one of each pair. They move around in some open subset of S to the S, sorry about the two S's. In other words, just the complex locus minus the real locus and the real points move around in the real locus of S, but they have to be general. So it means they avoid some real, it's a risky, some real algebraic subset and that real open subset may not be connected. So there's, so the wall crossing, the parameter space is not connected. So Velshinje found a way to make the number independent, essentially only depend on things being in the same topological component and having the same number of real points. So what Velshinju said is the following, you consider one of these real curves. So let's take one of these real rational curves and I'll draw a typical picture of it. Um, it will have ordinary double points and there are two kinds of ordinary double points over the reals. You have the usual kind. So here's your typical C that we're gonna be counting. And here the local equation would be something like X, Y equals zero plus higher order terms. So right here at this point, you can see the two tangents. But then there are also um, real singular points, which look like x squared plus y squared equals zero. Here at this point, the uh, isolated point. So Velshinje said, well, we count this one, let's call this point, this point P, this point Q. We say that MP is equal to plus one in this case, and MQ is equal to minus one. And you define, he defines the mass of the curve to be the product over all the real points P in the singular locus. This is assuming the singularities are only ordinary double points of these MPs. So this is plus and minus one. And then you have this Velshin J invariant of the configuration of the points. So what's the Velshin J invariant? It's the sum of these masses over all real curves C that we're considering, the ones which are real rational curves in the curve class D um, really maps, but since the map is giving the curve, uh, such that the C contains all these points. Okay, and what he showed the in Velshin J's Um, so invariance theorem states the following, that <clears throat> this number, this number, let me just abbreviate this P dot, depends only on the number of real points and the collection of classes, the real points in telling you which component it is in pi naught of S of R. Well, of course, since uh, a real rational curve 
the real points are connected, two points have to be in the same component. So it's just really telling you which, com which uh, connected component of S they're all in. If two of them are in different components, then this, then this number has to, of course, be zero. There aren't any curves. This is where i equals one to r. Okay, so that's that's Velshin J's theorem. All right. So um, what we want to do today is get a quadratic version of that. So our goal is a quadratic and purely algebraic uh, version. All right, so maybe I should say that uh, Velshin J originally proved this uh, using symplectic methods, but then um, Eatenberg, uh, Karlamov, Karlamov, and Schusten gave a essentially algebraic, mostly algebraic uh, discussion, which um, we rely on a lot, their, their work we rely on a lot to give this um, quadratic version. Okay, so what's the, what's, what's the goal? We want to find um, a suitable, on a suitable parameter space, we want to find a section of the Grotendieck-Witt sheaf on a suitable parameter space, parameterizing the configurations of points that we want to allow our curve to contain, such that, um, let me call that Q, ds, that's quadratic form, such that if we take qds and evaluate it on some configuration of points, and we take its rank, this should be this number nds. And if the configurations of points are real, let's write it that way, then this qds should be a real quadratic form, and its signature should be this Velshin J invariant. So that's, and then ask what, we can then try and ask what the arithmetic uh, additional information is, if any. Okay, so that's our goal. And so how do we start that? Well, first we wanna make, what's the suitable parameter space? So you see in the case of uh, the complex numbers, if you have n points, they're just n points. You could of course re reorder them. It doesn't change the problem anymore, but all the points will be complex points. But you saw already in Velshin J, you had some of the points were real, some of them are complex. And uh, if you think about it a minute, this condition of being a real configuration is just saying that your point P is a real point in the nth symmetric power of S, which actually, you also have to assume that all the points, it's general, so they have to be distinct. So there's an open subset of the nth symmetric power, which is just you take s to the n, remove all the diagonals and take the quotient by the symmetric group. So that's our parameter space. We're going to take points in sim n of s, zero, which sits inside sim n of s. And this thing, of course, is you take s to the n modulo the symmetric group. And this thing, you take s to the n minus all diagonals. again, modulo the symmetric group. So you can think of this thing as a sort of unordered configuration space. So this will be our parameter space. So a point, so what's a point in this thing? If you take P in there, it'll be a sum of closed points, let's say in sim n of S over some field K, where they one to R, the P1 up to PR are closed points in S base extended decay, such that the sum of the degrees over k of the residue fields, or let's say of the pi's, is equal to n. So over the algebraic closure, and they'll be distinct. So that's what this, that's what this guy does, and this guy here says the pi's are closed points and they're distinct. So over the algebraic closure, I get n distinct points on S over the algebraic closure. All right, so that's our parameter space. And how do we, uh, what's the moduli space? 
Well, we have our evaluation map from the Konsevich moduli space. This is defined over our, algebra, over our base field K, doesn't have to be algebraic clo algebraically closed. This maps to S to the N. We have our symmetric group acting here. And of course, we can lift that action here by just leaving the map alone and permuting the points. So the evaluation map then will be uh, sigma N invariant. And that gives us the quotient spaces or stacks, if you want to be fancy. It's called a quotient space, this thing here. This is the quotient space we just described as the symmetric and symmetric power of S. So we have evaluation map passes to there. And inside here, we have this unordered configuration space. And we just pull back to give us the object that we want to look at. There's notation, that's the pullback, right? So it's just, um, yeah. So not only are the points up here distinct on the curve, their images in uh, S will be distinct. All right, so that's the basic gadget and we have this map, everything, this is a, still a proper map. All right, and just by counting dimension, we already know that these two things have the same dimension, so it's a proper generically finite. Map. So what do we wanna do? Remember here in this situation, we had this NDS was equal to the degree of this evaluation map. In other words, the push forward of the fundamental class upstairs was NDS times the push forward times the fundamental class downstairs. So now we'd want to do a Grotendieck Witt version of that. So what we'd like, the, the quadratic analog is, we'd like to define our quadratic form. Um, what I call it, I guess I call this N. Should I call it NS? Yeah, NDS, Q, sorry, yes, that's what I did call it. QDS should be equal to, take the push forward of, well, the, the fundamental class is just the constant quadratic form one on the moduli space. Let me just abbreviate and call it M bar sigma. And this should be viewed as, as a section on this sim, and S zero of the sheaf of Grotendieck Witt rings. So just locally, it's given by a quadratic form and they patch together on overlaps. That's what this guy should be. And that's really all I need in order to be, to be able to evaluate it on points. I don't need a global quadratic form in order to be doing that. Okay, so that's what we'd like. And what's, how do we do this? Well, let's, the basic problem, here's the, main problem in just saying, let's just do that. The main problem in defining this thing is that this uh, chief GW is in the terminology I introduced right at the first lecture, it's not orientable, is not oriented, orientable. In the sense of A1 homotopy theory, but it, so in other words, you don't have push forward maps for this sheaf. For even for finite maps, even among smooth schemes, you need an orientation. So what kind of orientation it is, what I call SLC oriented. So this is actually easy to see um, from the point of view of Grotendieck duality theory, but in the interest of time, let me just skip that. Let me just say what this means in order to solve our problem. So to uh, make sense or to even have, of this EV lower star. So EV lower star, in other words, it is SL oriented. So remember, you have a canonical push forward from this guy here, assuming this is smooth. So we'll get to that in a minute, but it has to be twisted. It has to be twisted by the relative dualizing sheep. So let me call that omega of the map. So there is a push forward map here. I should put a little zero there, I guess. Sim N S zero GW. 
So that's where we have the push forward map. But unfortunately, you know, one has values in the untwisted sheaf. So what do you do? We have to identify this one with the untwisted one. So what we need is, since it's SLC oriented, what we need that means uh, you can ignore squares of invertible sheaves. So what we need is an isomorphism. So it's called an orientation. It's an isomorphism rho of this relative dualizing sheaf with the square of some line bundle. And then that will enable you to define this push forward map by using this guy to, um, you just do the following, you take well, on the sheaf level, you just take GW and then that'll be isomorphic. Doesn't it ignore squares? I'll say a little bit about this next time, uh, not next time, but a little later if I have time. You can safely ignore squares and then you apply rho to get over to GW of omega of the evaluation. And you just send, well, let me just say what it is. If you just have a one dimensional quadratic form, let's say lambda goes to lambda squared on the structure sheaf. Well, then you map L to L squared by taking a section lambda of L and sending it to the square. Or even if you put U, you put U times this, right? So here lambda is set of a section of O, it's a section of L and it's squares in L squared. So that's how you go from quadratic forms to quadratic forms with values in a square. You just multiply the source by L and the target gets multiplied by L squared. And then of course by rho, then you compose with rho going to omega. And that's how you end up over here. Okay, so, so that's Ma what Ma you Mark, there, yeah. there's a question of Sean Tilson ah. about materialization and the link between say SLC orientation and orientation of KO. You can does Betty realization under Betty, does this recover the orientation of, it's not really KO, it's like a sheaf version of KO. But if you do this for um, the motivic KO, then yes. Okay, is that, yeah, thanks. Okay, I should just put this to the side, I should. You're welcome, Sean. Okay, so let's see. So that's where we are, that's what we have to do. And now, um, oh yeah, so that's the problem, main problem, but there's a positive note. And this is why we use GW instead of KO. GW is an unramified sheaf. This makes life incredibly easy or easier. What does this mean? It means if I take Y smooth over my field K and I take F inside of Y co-dimension at least two, then the restriction map from H0 on Y G W to H0 on Y minus F G W is an isomorphism. So what that means is I can safely throw away so let's go back to the picture here. I want to study this evaluation map here. And this is generically finite. And I want to get something downstairs. So downstairs with this unramified property, I'm free to throw away anything I like of co-dimension at least two. And then I pull it back, take the inverse image of under the evaluation map and throw away the corresponding closed subset of the moduli space. And after doing that, what that says is, so after, so here's where a little geometry, after removing such an F from this sim N S zero, and then removing the inverse image from the moduli space, then this moduli space is smooth, it's a smooth scheme, and this evaluation map is finite. So there are no uh, stacky or singularity uh, related problems after doing this. And so throughout what I'm going to do, instead of keeping track of these Fs, I'm just going to uh, continually allow myself to do this and just not change the notation. So the, um, the 
the moduli space will get smaller and smaller. And I'll actually construct my form on some open subset of this uh, CMN of S0, but in the end, it'll extend uniquely to the CMN of S0, the whole thing. Okay, good. Um, let's see. So that's my basic fact. So now let's uh, see what we have to do in order to do this. So this brings us to the uh, geometry of the evaluation map and of course the moduli space. Okay, so what's the geometry? Well, there's, again, since I'm allowed to throw away co-dimension two things, the geometry is on telling me about the generic, the open subset, the general open subset, and some divisors. And it turns out there are only a few divisors that are relevant. So here they are. You have D cusp. So what is this? You take the set of all maps F from some P, in the tree of rational curves to S, together with the configuration of points X, let me just call that X dot, such that, well, P, so again, this is over an algebraically, this is over a geometric point, so P is irreducible and smooth, so it's just a P1, and um, F from P to its image, F of P is birational, okay? And uh, so it's not too far off from being isomorphism, and in general, these will always have singularities, a number of ordinary double points, but this has one non-ordinary double point. So f of p has a single non-ordinary double point singularity, namely an ordinary cusp, ordinary cusp. So that's the set, and then I take its closure, and that turns out to be a divisor. So what's an ordinary cusp? It looks like this, and it has local equations and analytic coordinates, y squared equals x cubed. Which is the same thing, except I take an ordinary tack node. So what's an ordinary tack node? That looks like this smiley thing. So in other words, y squared equals x to the fourth local coordinates. And then of course the closure of that set just as before. And then I have d trip, same thing, except I allow a single ordinary triple point a triple point, as you might imagine, is something that looks like this. So that's something like x times y times x plus y, or x minus y, I guess is what I drew here, equals zero. And then one more, d2. That's not the same thing. It's where my p is two components, p1 union p2. Pi's are both over the algebraic closure, P1. So it means there are two curves joined together, crossing normally like that. That's what the P looks like, like an X. And I assume as before, uh, F from P to F of P is birational. So generically an isomorphism. And F of P doesn't have any funny singularities, has only ordinary double points. So in particular, around this point here, the map is really an isomorphism. Okay, so those are the, um, oh, and then I have, those are the divisors, and then I have the interesting open subset called delta. Uh, this is the set of all Fs together with the points, let's ignore the points, such that um, if I take any G from P to S with the points, living in the inverse image of the image of F, then 
it's as good as you could possibly imagine, then P is a P1, G from P to G of P is birational. And uh, G of P has only ordinary double points. So this is, this is the good locus. This is where everything is as good as it can possibly be. All right, so uh, the first theorem, or the main theorem about this guy, let's see, so let me see if I can, can't keep too much of it there, but okay, so here's the theorem. Um, let's see, so you need an assumption. You need to assume that this DS is at least four, or that's the self-intersection of the canonical class. It's the embedding degree, or DS is equal to three, and the degree of the D is not seven, Seven is uh, not six, sorry, not six. Yeah, six is unlucky. Four uh, ds equals two and d is at least seven. And there's some other condition if ds is one, but uh, you don't want to hear it. Put dot, dot, dot. Um, then, first of all, um, the main point is that if you take the whole space minus these divisors, d cusp union d tack union d trip union d two, this is equal to this good space. So that's all there is. And again, after removing co-dimension two things, and secondly. Um, the evaluation map is unramified um, on the whole space minus d cusp. d cusp is the ramification locus. And uh, d cusp, uh, so uh, let's see, let's put it this way, this thing has simple. ramification along D cusp. So in other words, if T is a local defining equation for D cusp, it looks like T goes to T squared, right? Just like the smallest amount of ramification you can have. So what does that imply? Well, we're in characteristic zero, two is not divide the characteristic. So it says if you take the relative canonical sheaf, this is, everything is smooth, so this is an invertible sheaf. You have a canonical map, you have a canonical section of this thing, which is just, you take the differential of the evaluation map, it's a canonical section, and this says its divisor of this map is exactly one times d cusp, right? Because the derivative of t squared is two t dt. So the divisor of this thing is exactly d cusp, and that says if you compare this with the canonical map, of the structure sheaf to the structure sheaf twisted by the divisor d cusp, you get a nice amorphism here. So that identifies exactly what the canonical sheaf is. It's just the structure sheaf twisted by d cusp, at least isomorphic to that. All right, so that's half of the battle. We've identified what uh, the canonical sheaf is. Now we want to find something whose square is isomorphic to this. It's not apparent because, well, I don't have two d cusp, I have one times d cusp. So I can't use d cusp, I have to use something else. So what is the other thing? So that's the next part, the orientation. Or really from d cusp, but whatever, to L squared. Okay, so let me say a little bit about that. I'm kind of running out of time, so I won't say too much about it. But the idea is follows. You, the, this uses the universal map, curve and map. Right, that's what this moduli space is. It's a moduli space of maps of curves. So what is that? Well, we have our moduli space. And then over it, we have the 
universal curve. The fiber of this thing is the P that, that the F is mapping to. And then we have the map, F. And then we have the image curve, let's call that C. The image curve lives inside of the parameter space cross S. OK, and of course, this sits over here if I just P1. It's projection P. That's the story. If I take a fiber of this over a point, F, because I have all the sections of the Xs, I'm not going to worry about those. Take a fiber of this over some map, then I just get the map of the P corresponding to F to its image curve, F of P. That's what the C is. So the C is just F of P, if you like. All right. So um, let's look at this. Let's take the fiber over some good F. Again, geometric point. So these are the ones where it's as good as possible. And then, of course, we have these uh, marked points, but we're not going to worry about them. So here we have our point F, the fiber of P. PF is a P1, and it's mapping to CF, which is just F of P. Right? This is sitting inside of S. All right, so this thing contains its singular locus, CF sing. And remember, the condition that you're in this delta is that, in particular, the, this image curve, this map is birational, and the image curve has only ordinary double points. So if we make a picture of this, here's the image curve, blah, 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 here's my CF, and then the curve P is just a smooth P1. Here's PF, which is a P1. Okay, so I have all these singular points, let's call this one Y1, and there are a bunch more. This one is, let's say, YQ, there are Q of them, for instance. And of course, over y1, I have two points. I have y1 prime and y1 double prime mapping to that. And similarly, all the way down here, I have two points here, yq prime, yq double prime. All right, so now if I move around and close things up inside p and inside c, what does that do? I get the following picture. Um, Okay, let's see. So now I have P, here I have um, my, so P contains the part over the good locus, P delta, this maps to C delta. This contains, let's say, its relative singular locus. Those are these double points here on each fiber. And then over that, inside of here, I have D delta, which is the inverse image. So it's a two to one map for each of these singular points. I have the two inverse images on the smooth curve. And then I just close this guy up in here and, and take its normalization. So this thing will be the closure, sorry. This will be the, uh, closure of d delta, then normalize. OK, so let's call this map. And this thing, of course, maps to the moduli space. So we have this composition pi. And uh, so how does this look? Here's a little bit of geometry. Well, um, we're interested in this over two points. This is interesting. It turns out that nothing much happens over most of the divisors, There's only two divisors over which something happens. So let's take the generic, a generic point inside of D cusp. So, and then, uh, let's see, C cusp, and then we'll have the whole generic point of the modulus space specializing to this. So that gives me uh, my curve here, here's C eta, that's the image curve, and it'll have some other ordinary double points but then it will generate to this curve C eta cusp, which has this particular cusp here. Okay, now what happens on P? Here's P eta, here's P eta cusp. On P eta, these two points 
give me two points. This point gives me two points here, but this point only gives me one point here. And then the local calculation says it looks like this. So that's the geometry near a cusp. So you see that this thing is ramified to order one over d cusp. Now, what happens over, um, let's see, yeah, I still have a few minutes. So what happens on d tac? So again, let's have the same thing, eta tac. Here's eta, the generic point. Here's, so C eta tac. What does a tac node look like? It looks like this. Okay, this is C eta tac. And you can see what happens if I deform this, it looks like this. I mean, this is just a picture, but you can write down the equations, right? So here's a point y0. I have two points here. I have a y1 and a y2. They're converging to y0. And here, that means I have four points. So I have a y1 prime and a y2 prime, and then I have a y1 double prime and a y2 double prime. And what do they do? They just do this. You can again take local equations. So again, it's ramified to order two, but it occurs twice. So what does that tell me? It, well, it tells me that the discriminant of this map pi, remember pi is this map here, has divisor d cusp plus to d tac. Now, a discriminant is always a map. So since I'm almost out of time, I won't be able to tell you this. A discriminant is always a map to a square. It's always a section, a square of some bundle. This is just a general fact. And so since the divisor of the discriminant is, um, okay, so that says that the discriminant compared with the canonical map gives you an isomorphism here. And so what does that do? That tells you, that gives you this isomorphism. This is isomorphic to O twisted by D cusp. And this isomorphism tells you that this is isomorphic to M twisted by minus D tac tensor two. Well, there we are. This is my L tensor two. And this is my row. Okay, so in the remaining, so then we can make the following definition. We define this Q uh, DS to be the evaluation lower star of this one on M sigma zero. And one makes a computation that indeed, if we take some x in sim and s real, then the signature is q of zero ds x is equal to the Velshin j invariant at x. It's an easy computation. And of course, the rank is just the degree of the map, so the rank of this qds is NDS. So let me, in the remaining minute, let me state the invariance theorem. It says the following. So suppose we have um, two points. That are um, both in sim and s zero of some field k. And let's assume, let's let k, suppose, suppose that the fields are the same. So they have the same residue field type after reordering. So if this is true, and if the class of xi is equal to the class of yi in the A1 pi naught of S evaluated at Ki, then the Q S at X is equal to the Q 
ds and y. So this recovers uh, Velshin J's theorem, and it's exactly time to stop. So I'll stop here. Thanks very much. So thanks a lot, Mark, for the series of, talk, of, of, of nice talks. And, and uh, we, we will start with uh, questions now. So I have questions to start. So first, uh, it seems that the, the orientation you choose is uh, really important here. Yes. I mean, and how 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 is it shows up? In, how is it show up in the in the computations? The choice of the orientation that you make. Well, if you had a different orientation, so we had these two uh, things that we wanted. We wanted to recover the Velshin J invariant. I mean, the, the rank is the degree is automatic, but we wanted to recover the Velshin J invariant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, the idea, the original idea I had before this uh, joint paper was to look at the uh, local defining equation, which gave us the Velshin J invariant. So remember that the Velshin J invariant was defined if I had a curve, that a real curve that looked like this, it looked like x squared minus y squared, equals zero, then that gave us a plus one. And if it looked like this, it looks like x squared plus y squared equals zero. And it gave us a minus one. So um, now, on the other hand, if you take the, the local defining this equation, you view this, you take the differential of this thing, then you have the local Euler class, and it's exactly the opposite of this over the reals. So my first idea was to use the local defining equation, take the local, sorry, this is, this is the point uh, zero. You look, take the local Euler uh, class of the differential of the equation, then you could use this for your M zero. That was the idea. And uh, that gave you exactly the opposite of this thing. So that, that worked, at least I worked it out for P2. But then uh, we had this idea and uh, that instead of that, you can take the, remember we had this double cover, right? If you had this guy here, then you have the singular locus, you have this double cover. So if this is my point uh, Y and this is Y prime, Y double prime. This gives me a double cover, KY, inside of k y prime, say choosing one of the roots. And if you take the discriminant of this extension, this is exactly equal to minus the local Euler class of the point. So this discriminant, if you factor the, see we got the orientation by taking the discriminant of the double points upstairs all the way down to the moduli space. So you can factor that as first mapping to the singular locus and then mapping to the moduli space. And since this original degree is two, uh, that will give you the discriminant of this map times the, some discriminant coming from the rest of it, but squared. So that says that this discriminant that we wrote down is exactly giving you minus this thing, which is exactly the same as the Velshin Jr. So that's how we were uh, motivated by it, but there's nothing that says you couldn't find another one. Okay, so there, there is a, uh, can you see if you have a question? Uh, oh, yeah. From... Oh, yeah. I can... What yeah. goes wrong in positive characteristic? Well, not, yeah. So what goes wrong in positive characteristic is the geometry has been much uh, less investigated and there are lots of problems. I mean, the, this was an extended exercise in, in deformation theory. And a lot of things go wrong in positive characteristic with deformation theory. For example, if you just look at an equation like y squared equals, let's say, a, a high order tack node. Well, once the characteristic starts dividing this uh, exponent, then you run into trouble. And you have to, yeah, remember at, the, at this basic geometric uh, property that um, the divisors that I wrote down were the only ones of interest after you throw away things of co-dimension two, and you have to get rid of all these other possibilities first in order to achieve that. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to understand the local deformation theory of these singularities in order to do that. And the same thing with the high order cusps. So once the characteristic starts dividing that, then you run into trouble. But there's this nice trick to go from characteristic zero to characteristic P. If you just assume that uh, your moduli space in characteristic P is generically nice. So if you assume like, which is the case for P2, for example, you assume that there's some dense open subset, which uh, lifts smoothly to characteristic zero, then you can just take the degeneration, yeah, and you assume maybe there are no other components of high dimension. So let's say uh, you assume that the moduli space in characteristic P that you're interested in is irreducible and has, um, yeah, has a dense open subset that lifts uh, nicely to characteristic zero. Then you have this section uh, you can define this same gadget on the open subset. You can make the same definition. You have all the tools you need to define the orientation, to define the quadratic form, but just on some open subset, and then uh, the symmetric power. But then uh, if you look at the total family, what's missing? What's missing is something co-dimension one in characteristic P, but on the total space, it's co-dimension two. So in fact, you have this uh, beautiful theorem of um, Panin uh, Oyangran that says that the, uh, the Grotendieck Wittschief is actually, even in mixed characteristic, unramified. So then you can extend over that and you do get a quadratic uh, section of the quadratic forms, even in characteristic P, uh, P not equal to two, under these uh, geometric assumptions. Uh, but it's, it's again, for an arbitrary uh, surface and divisor, it's not at all clear if these uh, geometric conditions are satisfied as they are. Remember, we even had to have some funny conditions on um, that the degree shouldn't be too low and that the degree of the divisor shouldn't, the degree of the surface shouldn't be too low, shouldn't be uh, one, for example, or you need special arguments in case the degree is one and the degree of the divisor should be sufficiently large. So, um, yeah, in jet, it's, uh, there are little technical problems with uh, the geometry in general. So that's what goes along with positive characteristics. So how, how does this work over number fields, for example? Do you... Yeah, it works fine over number fields. There are but then what, what can you compute then? Because you, you uh, yeah, compute from over number fields. I don't know. So, okay. So it's difficult uh, to compute. So, okay. um, yeah, the, the techniques you have for computing these things, they uh, don't obviously go through to the quadratic case. So uh, ha we have some ideas for how to do this, but uh, it's still in the uh, thinking stage. Okay. <laughs> there are lots of things for the real case. I mean, people have used tropical methods to compute the real case. So yeah. um, it tells you, so if you assume, for example, that your moduli space Let's say you do it for P2. So that's something unramified over Z. And you could hope then that the moduli space with this whole situation is unramified over Z. Well, if that's the case, and you would expect then that your quadratic form would be um, unramified over Z in some sense, then it would be easy to compute. It should be um, just a hyperbolic form plus some number of multiples of one. And you can compute it by knowing the NDS ah. and knowing what happens over the reals, ah. which we know about Belshin chain theory. So that, okay. would, that would be a conjecture as to what the answer would be. But in general, it's hard to tell because most of these um, Del Pezzo surfaces won't be unramified over Z. Hmm. Okay. Another uh, question? If the yeah. modulus maybe, maybe I will ask. Uh, yeah. This is Vanya. Uh, uh, no, uh, maybe uh, I will ask uh, over the question. Okay. So in your invariance theorem, uh, the condition on xi and yi, um, uh, uh, the condition is use the shift by not a1. Yes. But, but uh, can you make, replace this condition by a weaker one, uh, namely using stable by not, by not not? Oh yeah, 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 that's right. So you'd, you'd, you'd uh, made this remark before, so I should thank you for that. And thanks for pointing this out. Uh, yes, you can replace that with a stable. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. 
sort of cruder because, invariant. Uh, it gives you uh, more identities. Yes. It's more computable. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. So there is a, a, an addition to a question of Stephen McKean. Can you see that? Yes, so if your moduli space minus the bad locus is not a scheme, would you want to push forward a virtual motivic fundamental class? Well, you don't have to. So that's the, that's the thing. If you were to try and do this in, um, in uh, say, KO theory, Hermitian K theory, that's a more global invariant. So this is really just uh, the analog is right at the very beginning. If you want to compute the degree of a map, you can restrict to any open subset you like on the base. And it doesn't change, you know, as long as the, the source and target are irreducible, it doesn't change the degree of the map. So that's exactly the situation here because the grotendieck witschief is unramified. You can, make the, you can make the definition by restricting to any open subset you like, and then, then you don't have to worry about stacky stuff on the moduli stack because you have this big open subset where it's actually a smooth scheme. So um, a virtual fundamental class in this case is not necessary. So this is the unobstructed, in some sense, the unobstructed case, but it's completely correct if you work in other more complicated moduli spaces where the dimension is not correct, then you need a virtual fundamental class. And we do have a very nice theory of virtual fundamental classes available in the in motivic homotopy theory. And there's this, this nice work of Adil Khan, where he does things in terms of stacks and quasi smooth morphisms. So that's really beautiful. Uh, but that, uh, since using stacks, since these are more or less required to have some kind of atal descent properties, um, you really need to work with Q coefficients and uh, theories that satisfy atal descent, which the grotendieck vitschi definitely does not. So that's not, not a good choice if you want to use get quadratic invariants. So you really have to stick with things which are just uh, Nisnevich local. And, um, but if you stick with schemes rather than stacks, in other words, um, if you, for, there are many examples where the moduli stack is really a, has an open subset, which is a scheme, or even can be considered a scheme, like things that come in, uh, so symmetric obstruction theories on many moduli spaces are of this form. Uh, and in that case, there's a really not, there's a completely general theory of virtual fundamental classes in the motivic sense, and it makes perfect good sense to evaluate those and get quadratic invariants. So, and it would be, it's possible, I mean, of course, people would like to do this in, in greater generality to extend this, uh, these virtual fundamental classes in the, for, uh, quadratic invariants to, to stacks, but that's sort of an ongoing thing at present. Okay, so there's a remark that's of, of Kirsten that you, everyone can see, so about computation, and over, over computation of, of, of mark for pencil nodal curves in a pencil of cubics. Ah. So just an advertisement. Yeah, there's some of the chat I can't find on my screen for some reason. Oh, more chat. Oh, there we go. Ah, okay. Oh yeah, right. Yes. That's right, Chris. Thank you. So yeah, so you can make, there's some specific, the simplest one where you can make a specific calculation is for a pencil of cubic curves. And then you can use this riemann hurwitz formula from last time to compute everything. And you get something which is not, um, which has ramifications. So it's not, um, in, it's not sums of ones and minus ones. Thanks, Chris. Okay, 15 minutes. It seems that we have finished all the questions. So, Let's thanks again, Mark, for, for, for his nice series of lectures. Thanks a lot. And uh, for attending. Appreciate it.